Please bow your heads with me. Dear Lord, please bless these words. Please bless these readings. Please bless these scriptures to our understanding. Help us to know you more through your words and through your teaching. Please bless the words of our pastor as she seeks to illuminate these scriptures to our understanding. And Lord, we ask that you would ease our minds and calm our hearts that, so that we can be open and receive you this morning. Amen. We'll read together from the book of Mark this morning and Hebrews. So we'll start in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. You can follow along in your few Bibles if you wish, or you can just listen. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign when these things are all to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, Take heed that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginnings of the sufferings. We turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 11 through 25. <coughs> and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, then to wait until his enemies should be made a stool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their misdeeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way which he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope with, without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The word of the Lord. that we used. 
And uh, two weeks ago, though, I have a small group, most of you know, and so every week I meet with a group of pastors and we go through the lectionary texts for a week and a half away, right? So the lectionary, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is kind of a rotation of scriptures that inform the church. Many, many churches use this lectionary. And so, of course, in my small group, we still, we're using those texts even though I've been off the lectionary for a while, right? So two weeks ago, we read this text from Mark, right? So go back, so just in case you zoned out, which sometimes I zone out when people read scripture too. Virginia Woolf said that if Shakespeare was read in small snippets by people in a monotone voice, we would hate Shakespeare too. Not that she read in a monotone voice, but you know what I mean. So, so come on now, I'm just off manuscript. So the text was, you know, Jesus' disciples are walking and they're in the temple and they point up to the stones and they say, Jesus, look at these stones. They're so big and amazing. And then Jesus says, oh, they're going to be torn down. And so when we read this in my lectionary group, I laughed out loud and my friend said, what are you laughing at? And I said, well, the text, this text is for the Sunday, the last Sunday in my capital campaign. And so they laughed too. But then there was this horrible pause. And one of them, my brave friend, looked at me and said, I think you should still preach it anyway. So I'm going to, because the truth is that the building we are sitting in will be torn down. Buildings don't last. Church is not the building. The church has never been the buildings. And so even the sanctuary that we will build, whenever that is, that sanctuary probably won't last forever. We hope it lasts a little longer than this one lasted but it won't last forever. Our hope is not in a building, right? Our hope is not in the stones, but in the life that we gain while we sit together inside the stones. The context for this, this passage in Mark was one of devastation. It's, um, it isn't always easy to find comfort in God's presence when we're actually experiencing pain, right? It's hard to hold on to hope when the world seems to be falling apart around us. And this section of Mark that we read from today is called a mini-apocalypse, right? David Lewis says, apocalyptic literature stems from a worldview that believes everything, happen everything that happens on earth represents or correlates with a larger heavenly struggle between good and evil, right? In other words, all earthly events have cosmic significance. Apocalyptic literature taught, tries to offer comfort to those who are experiencing devastation by making sense of current events. Now, apocalyptic literature is also highly symbolic language. And so many, and we have experienced it even in our world, many use this symbolic language to make predictions about the end of the world. That's, that's what we hear people using it most. But that's actually not what it was written for, right? The text that we read this morning was written to a specific group of people who were trying to make sense of specific things happening in their world, right? The Gospel of Mark was written some 50 years after Jesus died. The temple had actually already been destroyed. So the writer is putting words in Jesus' mouth to help make sense of something that happened much later, right? The stones of the temple had been torn down. And so we have a text where the writer makes Jesus say, whether he said it or not, these earthquakes and the wars, they're actually birth pangs. They are signs of the end. No, they're signs of a beginning, is what Jesus tells his disciples. Now, without the temple, Judaism had to have a major shift in their religious rituals, right? All the sacrifices that they would bring to the temple, that ritual had to be redone. They would bring, remade. They would bring sacrifices to the temple to confess their sin, and it was their way to bring prayers to God, right? So without the temple, without the priests to offer the sacrifices, how would they worship God? It's a big question, right? We, we kind of have to like try to step into their context to feel how weird it must have felt and how scary and unstable for them. Uh, I guess we have to almost imagine what would, ha what, would happen, what would have to happen to us, like especially in America where we have such great religious freedom to totally have to revamp faith, not just religion. 
So the writer of Hebrews is also working to answer the same question. And his or her writing comes much later even than John, and even than Mark's gospel, right? We can surmise that for at least a hundred years, people were trying to settle into whatever was new. It took a long time for this one kind of religious <coughs> manner of temple worship to change into something else. It took a long time to transition, right? Birth from devastation didn't happen overnight. The writer of Hebrews says that we don't need to sacrifice anymore because Jesus' death functions as a sacrifice to end all sacrifices, right? Now, I just started reading Nadia Boltz Weber's book, Accidental Saints. She's a Lutheran pastor. And in the beginning of the book, she is telling the story of how she committed a horrible sin against a parishioner. And then the parishioner died. <coughs> and before she could bring herself to do the funeral, she wanted to confess to someone what she had done. And so as an aside, I'm going to say that um, in the Reformation, we threw out the act of confessing, right? Um, and I, I, I kind of think that it's one of the babies we threw out with the bathwater. Not necessarily confessing to a priest or a pastor, but confessing to one another. Because there's nothing more healing than confessing our sins out loud and not just to God. Anyway, Nadia called her friend and she told her the whole story. And the story, the gist of it is that there was a man in her congregation that she just didn't like. And she was sending out an email invitation for everyone to go to a retreat. And she left his email address off on purpose. How very sinful and how very human. And so after she confessed to her friend, her friend looked her in the eye and said, Nadia, Jesus died for all of your sins, even this one. And then she writes this. She said, I have squandered plenty of ink arguing against the notion that God had to kill Jesus because we were bad. But when my friend said that Jesus died for our sins, including that one, I was reminded again that there is nothing we can do that God cannot redeem. Small betrayals, large infractions, minor offenses, all of it. Some would say that instead of Jesus' death being about Jesus standing in for us to take a really bad spanking from God for our own naughtiness, what happens at the cross is a blessed exchange. God gathers up all of our sin, all of our broken junk into God's own self and transforms it from death to life and then offers it to us as a blessing. That's what salvation is, everybody. And all the real although the reality of Jesus' death happened in one moment of time, the path of salvation for us happens over our lifetime. Salvation is a process of repentance and forgiveness and new birth. Salvation is what happens when we move from sorrow to joy, anytime we move from sorrow to joy, or despair to hope, or destruction to wholeness. Salvation is what happens when we're able to leave isolation and go back to community. When we're able to pardon ourselves of our guilt. When we can take our fear and replace it with faith. That's what salvation is. That's salvation. And the writer of Hebrews actually maps out a process of salvation for us. First in the process is to enter God's presence with all of the muck that I have. All of my sorrow and my guilt and my alienation and my shame. Me to enter with me. Facing God, knowing that I am loved. We are loved. You are loved. Deeply, lavishly loved. In order to do that, it takes a lot of self-acceptance, doesn't it? And many of us have been told our whole lives that we are unlovable, we are unworthy, and even unwanted. That is not what God thinks. The scriptures say we are to love our neighbors as what? As we love ourselves. 
So the first step in the path of salvation is loving ourselves so that we can approach God. And here's what happens. When we love ourselves, loving our neighbor comes next. It follows. Which I guess we could say that if we're having a hard time loving our neighbor, we're probably having a hard time loving ourselves. And that that's okay, because we all struggle with loving ourselves. So the second step is exercising our faith in action, loving the people next to us, and then beyond that, and then beyond that. And then the third step is contained in one of the, my favorite sections of the Bible. It was the last couple verses that Aaron read. Therefore, let us consider how we can spur one another on to love and good deeds, and let us not stop meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but all the more as the day approaches. Spur one another is more than just encourage, right? Spur means prompt or even provoke. I read someone say it was irritate someone to love and good deeds. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to be irritated to love someone, but okay, right? To spur one another. How are we to live this life with God when we cannot rely on buildings? That's, that's what they're answering, right? Because the church is not buildings. Our hope is not in buildings. Not in this building or the new building. Our hope is in the person who made the path of salvation possible for us. Our hope is in the person who offers us this blessed exchange. I'll take what you have and I'll give you what I have. Now Jesus did his work, and now we have to do ours. Right? To love ourselves enough to approach God, who loves us way more than we love ourselves. To love one another, and to spur one another on to good deeds. We've got work to do. Because there is sorrow in the world, and despair, and fear, and brokenness, and there are wars, and rumors of wars, and borders that get closed after attacks. There were almost 90 of us here last night who made a commitment to one another over a meal. And I wonder, can we commit also this morning to be people who find the path of salvation together? Granted, that's a lot more intense than just giving me a check to build a new building, right? But buildings don't last. And so we need to make a commitment to find the path of salvation together. Many of you still have pledge cards that you haven't turned in, and even more have volunteer commitment cards that you haven't turned in either. But you also received a cutout, I hope, in your bulletin. Does everyone have a little cutout that looked like those things up there? So I wonder if you would take it out and you would write one word or a phrase, perhaps, that expresses your commitment to our congregation or to your faith at this time in your life. A commitment that expresses, a word or phrase that expresses a commitment to the congregation or to your faith at this time. So I'll give you a little bit of time to fill that out or have other things you can fill out. Then we're going to sing, I mean, then we're going to pray a little bit, and then we're going to sing, and while we sing, I'm going to invite you to bring all of